The surprise is not old. No one would call her old. She's a bluff bow, lovely lions. She's a fine seabird. Weatherly, stiff, and fast. Very fast, if she's well handled. No, she's not old. She's in her prime. We interrupt this program to bring you a special report. This is Cheap Seat Reviews. <laughs> what does that mean, sail us out? What, what does that mean, sail us out? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the Gladiator Arena, here is the Barbarian Horde. Man, that hurt. Action adjacent is probably the best way to put it. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, he sacrificed everything he had to make sure he was in this episode, so please listen. Hello, and thank you for listening to Cheap Seat Reviews, the podcast that explores the Hollywood film industry for the greater good. The greater good. There you go. Yeah, not bad. This is episode... Yeah, the greater good. There you go. The oh. greater good. <laughs> 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 oh, Maybe if we would have practiced uh, ahead of time, we could have like actually had a nice little chant there. But we practice <laughs> nothing ahead of time. We plan nothing. This is, episode... is a one-take show. That is one hundred percent accurate, and there is no fixing it in post. Also, I don't, I don't do any of that garbage. This is episode three hundred and fifty-seven, and today we're talking about Master and Commander, far side of the something, far side of the planet, far side of the ocean. I think it's the world, isn't it? Far, far side of the world. world. Oh, it's there the go. far side of the world. Too. Oh, very the important. Getting that the in there. Yeah, yeah, I got to get there. In there, right, the far side of the world. Okay, I am Sean Allred, and joining me tonight is Andrew. Closed captioning really saved my life on this movie, Jimison. Well, Sean, I just want to say I, I have not seen this much semen since I was in middle school. And the there was semen everywhere. I mean, there was semen on every part of that ship. And just old, wanted to share that with you. Old and young and, and hairy. All kinds. Yeah, it was like a semen convenience store with multiple different uh convenience store. <laughs> this joke just know. got weird. Okay. It got weird and worse at the same time. I'll just shut up now. Oh my gosh. No, that's that's both fine and uh dandy. I don't know what I'm saying. I don't I that's fine. <laughs> Huzzah for you. Huzzah for me. Okay. Um <laughs> Uh, joining us, making their Cheap Seat Reviews debut, is Mark gets extra grog for doing a good show. Mm. And, Sounds right. And Joe, surprise musket ball to the face from the Digital Dissection Podcast. Yeah, that's what I like to put it. Right in the face. Right in the face. Right in the face. Yeah, yeah I just... That poor guy that was like there the whole movie, and he's like, "Oh, I guess we won." Boom, he's dead. Boom. Yeah, yeah. yeah that was that was definitely oh. a shocking moment. Like, oh, I thought he was going to go the distance. Yeah, and he. In did all not. fairness, he he had trouble seeing because there was a lot of semen in his face. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a surprise. Is that's the thing? It was like, a surprise. Mm-hmm. They, like they weren't there, and then boom, right in the face. That's where they were. They were French and everywhere. Oh <laughs> man, this joke's gonna just carry us all through the movie. <laughs> oh, this is 2003's Master and Commander, and I am so excited to have you guys here from the Digital Dissection Podcast. How are you guys doing? Well, I'm doing, I'm doing great. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to be here. Happy working with you again, uh, since the last time we are on a ship together was in outer space. And now, now we're just off the coast of Brazil. It's going to be exciting. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes we're off for Brazil, and then five mm-hmm. minutes later, we're rounding the Cape, uh, Cape yeah. Horn. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, the horn of new new horn. What's it called? Horn something. The horn. I just called it the horn. Yep, the horn. We're called it's, the horn's fine. It's the bottom of the the, bar, the bottom of the uh, South America. South America. Yep. And mm-hmm. then about five it's, minutes. It's Chile. Later, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then about five mm-hmm. minutes later, they're in the Galapagos Islands, which is about two thousand miles north. And uh-huh. about twenty years before Darwin got there, too. Well, <laughs> but it's like you can retcon it because they didn't get to take anything back yeah, with us. With that, them. that was the fun mm-hmm. part of it, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah. that's how sea travel works. I found that out while watching this movie that if I need to go like a really short distance, I just need to be in a boat. Like, that's really the lessons <laughs> I took away from this. Or if mm-hmm. you need to go a really long distance, then nothing will have happened between point A and point B unless <laughs> the story needs it to happen. 
<laughs> and if you show no landmarks or land for ma- the majority of your time at sea, mm-hmm. you could travel anywhere you want as quick as you can. Yeah. It, that, that, yeah. It, that boat just felt like it was teeming with food all the time, right? Like there was oh, never yeah. any, hey, you know, we really should, because there's a couple of moments where they do say, hey, it would be nice to get some fresh water and some provisions. But it was never like, hey, we haven't had meat in three weeks, right? Mm-hmm. You know, something like that. Anyway. And zero scurvy, by the way. Yeah. yeah. No no <laughs> weird at-sea at diseases, not once in this yeah. entire movie. Just uh, a curse, I guess. We've yeah, had nothing curse. to eat but pudding-shaped as island for three stinking days. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> that pudding was so thick and weird-looking. Like, the, I know. Well, the uh, officer's mess pudding didn't really mm-hmm. bother me. It was when life was hard and every man was shirtless and they were scooping what I can't imagine being edible into those <laughs> plates. Mm-hmm. It, it, you know what I'm saying? Like it, it looked like, I don't know what did it look like. And I just, I, honestly, this is going to sound dumb. It reminded me of that episode of Firefly when they go to Jamestown where like mud is like everything and they're drinking that mutter's milk. Like it looked like bread soaked in mud. <laughs> Oh, like, like that's what it looks yeah, like. That that makes sense. That oh, checks. It was gross. Oof. Uh but I think we're getting uh, a little ahead of ourselves. Uh, 2003's Master and Commander: The Far Side of the World. Andrew, what is this movie? In case you don't know what it is, because I actually talked to a couple people today that had no idea what this movie was. Well, there's a good reason they may not know what this movie is, and I think we'll get into that later. But if you don't know. During the Napoleonic Wars, a brash British captain pushes his sea his ship. Sorry, I started to say his seaman <laughs> uh, pushes his ship and crew to their limits in pursuit of a formidable French war vessel around South America. All right, is he? What was the word that he used? Prickly? No. What was the word? Uh, uh, a brash captain? Is he brash? Yeah. I don't think of him as brash. Is he? I don't either. Yeah. Titular, maybe, but not brash. Yeah, because he's, I mean, yeah, he yells at the doctor a couple of times about duty mm-hmm. and honor and, and some of that other stuff, but there's a lot of the time where he's just kind of a jolly captain. Yeah, I mean, there yeah. was that one time where he came up and yelled at the helmsman and said, you fool of a tuck, next time throw yourself in and rid us of your stupidity. Yeah, but other than yeah. that, pretty nice guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He was, uh, he's like professionally plucky, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like, like, if you had to put sense. Plucky on a resume, this guy would have it all jazzed up. You know, it'd be in Times New Roman. It would not be in Comic Sans. No, he's not a Comic Sans guy. No, definitely no. not. Mm-mm. Or, I don't know, whatever the font that Sam put on our poster this week, whatever that is. But, yeah, <laughs> like that. He, he's God, a very so prim- tasteful. Uh, very so prim- tasteful. Yeah, no, I'm, I, no, I love it. I really love it. In fact, I kind of want to keep it for a while, honestly. <laughs> I, I do. I like that. I like that font. Um. I like it better than the one I chose, which is fine. <laughs> uh, so this movie, I think uh, Andrew kind of hinted to as to, uh, well, he mentioned made mention that no one heard this movie. I guess I did, but you mentioned why. Yeah, this movie came out in 2003, and um, no one watched it. And I think that's a shame. I really do. So this movie had a budget, a budget of $150 million. That's a big budget movie. I mean, that's... Yeah. Uh, that's summer blockbuster esque movie money, mm-hmm. and it only grossed worldwide two hundred and eleven million. Oh, and I say only. I know it's two hundred eleven million dollars, but I mean that only. Mean, that is only when they. I mean, that was like what they, what double. I mean, they made their money back plus only a hundred million on that. Well, see, the budget is a weird term, especially on IMDb yeah. because mm-hmm. it says budget estimated one hundred and fifty million. So you take that hundred and fifty million, think that that's probably a hundred. Oh, one hundred fifty, not hundred. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. between a hundred and hundred and fifty on production. Yeah, and then not advertising to, or anything else. Yeah, you have you have mm-hmm. to add another thirty or forty million on marketing. So let's just say, Oof. let's say the movie did cost a true one fifty. Mm-hmm. You know, it only made sixty million dollars, right? Is that math yeah. right? Yeah, it made sixty something million dollars for the fact that. And this is also weird. I, I noticed this immediately because I, I, these are the dumb things I notice. I, I'm always interested in seeing how many production companies it takes to make a movie. You know, especially since mm-hmm. we've been doing a lot of, <laughs> yeah. we've been doing a lot of Netflix mm-hmm. and like uh, Prime original movies over the last year. 
And so mm-hmm. those are all made by like 11 small companies because none of them can take the weight of a big, big budget. Mm-hmm. But yeah. what, the first thing that you see on this is 20th Century Fox. I'm like, yeah. Oh, that's, that's, that's a big company. And then the Universal logo. And I'm like, what? Mm-hmm. Who, how did that marry? Yeah. And then Miramax, Max, which, is the, yeah. which is at the time the Disney thing where Disney would make movies if they wanted it to be PG-13 or R. They would do yeah. it under the Miramax. I thought, mm-hmm. that's three big studios. Yeah, it's like three yeah. mafia families getting together to make this movie. Well, I mean, it's yeah. like heard of. it's like Disney uh, or Marvel and Sony getting together to make a Spider-Man movie. Like, mm-hmm. I was fully expecting to see MTV Films pop up at the end of it too. You know, I thought hey, New Line was coming up next. New yeah, Line, just bring them on in. Yeah, New Line actually would have been very appropriate for O three. I was going to say Summit, mm-hmm. but Summit was a couple of years <laughs> later with um, Twilight. Mm-hmm. Twilight actually made Early. the company. Early Lionsgate, maybe, you know, back yeah. when they were still doing yeah, all the yeah. mechanical looking mm-hmm. intros. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I, I do have to d- go on a, a dumb segue. But when I was doing my internship, uh, I, I did it at a production company. And one of my first projects was I was given it was the it was a production company um, had hired us to create their logo, you know, the little cinematic logo. And so it was a sailing ship coming towards the camera on the seas and then it, it kind of turned to kind of side shot of the of the of the camera so to speak and then freeze frames there and then that's when the production comes up and it was i don't know what it was it was full wind or half sail <laughs> i don't remember the name of the company but my job was to create the sound of the ship right yeah. so i put a little bit of a little wind sound in there and then I found some like creaking sounds and then Ooh, and yeah. uh, like a like a bell you know off in the distance and then a little bit mm-hmm. of the waves and so when you have all that as the bed and then they had already pre-bought some music to kind of go over it as it came in it kind of created a nice little 12 second feature you know 8 second feature of the boat coming it was kind of fun but but like nowadays those 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 become so very cinematic i mean not just the fact that Marvel's lo- the logo has grown to what it is, and the mm-hmm. Universal yeah. one is, has grown, but a lot of these, these small companies have these very cinematic uh, companies. I just I find that interesting. Anyway, I digress. Yeah. What I want to go to now is to say that this movie stars Russell Crowe uh, and Paul Bettany and a bunch of other people that we've seen a lot from British films. You mentioned um, Pippin. Who is yeah. uh, uh, what Billy Boyd? I think is his mm-hmm. name. Yeah, yeah, old Billy Boyd. And he's uh, and he's got some. Uh, he's got a pretty good little role in this movie. He's, yeah, it's not bad. He's got like what four or five lines. Yeah, um, but you see him a lot, even though he might not be saying anything. Yeah, he's on mm-hmm. camera a lot. His face is on camera a lot. He had that scar across his face. Looked yeah. really cool. Mm-hmm. You know, he looked. Yep. Really- he looked like a Navy guy, honestly. He, he looked- did. And like, I think at one point, like he's like crawling, like he's like not crawling. He's like repelled down or belayed down yeah. uh, to see the damage <laughs> to the rudder. And then he just like muscles his way back up. Yeah. It's like, wow. Sailing was hard once upon a time. Holy yeah. crap. <laughs> yeah. You had to, that was tough work. That's why they got paid a lot though. Um, mm-hmm. And a swap the poop deck. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of that. A lot of yeah. other, a lot of other really great actors in this movie. Um, uh, Chris, uh, I'm trying to think, who's the guy who got shot in the face? I can't find him, but he, uh, Ian, Ian oh, Mercer, he was the dude that was also in Gladiator, right? He was the guy that yeah. made the announcements in Gladiator. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's where I recognize him. Yeah, he was. He was the guy you know, that would. Yeah. Had that one great, thing I couldn't that shake. Great voice and would scream. Ladies and gentlemen of the Gladiator Arena, here is the Barbarian <laughs> Horde. Man, that hurt to do. <laughs> I, I was actually distracted by uh, David Threlfall during this movie, who, if you don't know who that is, he kind of looks like Eric Idle. If you, if you kind of catch yeah. a stray shot of him, mm-hmm. yeah, the whole time you're like, oh, is, this a, is this a Python film? Like, what is he doing here? <laughs> But David Threlfall was actually the actor uh, in Hot Fuzz uh, who's chosen to be murdered <laughs> by, <laughs> by the council. So, like, I, I knew who he was, but, like, yeah, like, if, you just, if you're just casually checking this out, it's like, mm-hmm. like is, this, is that Eric Idle? I mean, it, it's, it shocked <laughs> me, like, ten times. That's funny. 
Yeah, no, I just saw that. I just looked on him. Yeah, there's again the the cast. I think is really good. And again, mm-hmm. it, it's a dude cast, right? Like the only woman in the in oh, the yeah. whole movie has no lines. She's just a pretty Brazilian lady. Yep. Um, and and that's it. And that, I mean, it's a dude movie, and that's fine. I mean, you mm-hmm. you, you kind of know what you're getting into with this kind of a thing. But uh, you refer to this as a as a hot dog cart. That's what this <laughs> on, movie was on water, nice. I guess. Mm-hmm. No. <laughs> right, <Yeah. laughs> it's, a, it's a sailing hot dog cart. Um, yeah, it's exactly are, what the village people promised in their. You guys are I nicer believe. than me. I, I just called it a bag of dicks, but <laughs> well, the boat, a boat of dicks, uh, yeah, a, a vessel, a vessel of dicks. There, vessel. <laughs> there you Ooh, go. That's a fancy sound. When we put vessel in there. I love. This is another dumb thing that I love. I love. Um, what are they called? Uh, Vienna sausages. I do like those, but I also like um, <laughs> when pigs you, in a blanket. Na- names, uh, group pronouns, right? Like uh, a murder of crows. Uh, oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, you know, like uh, one of my favorites is uh, a gaggle, a gaggle of geese, a glaring of cats. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you like cavalcade? Cav- cavalcade, hop in there for you. Cavalcade's a fun one. Uh, what is a cavalcade? Yeah. I can't remember what that one is. I don't remember. Uh, how about a synth, an, or an orchestra of crickets? You like that one? <laughs> oh, seriously? That's just that, that's false advertising. Those they're just annoying. Yeah, well, but they you know whatever. So there's that one. <laughs> um, my favorite one is uh, a group of um, a group of Karens. It's called a privilege. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. Well, I have one of those back there in the. <laughs> His wife's name. A is box Karen. of Karens. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I know for a while that there was like a petition to make a group of squids a squad. Nice. I don't know Ooh. if that ever like went through or not. Because I mean, it was a it was a change dot org, so it really didn't do anything. Sure, is my guess. Yeah, I threw out a in squad the of um, squids. It's kind of cool though. I know, right? That's a great name. Yeah, a squid squad. A squid. The squid well, squad. and then a group of Kennedys is called the tragedy. Nice. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> Ooh. Sorry. Sorry. No, I. You're- I I say things. I'm sorry, Sean. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> We've, things have been said a lot worse uh, on this show, but believe me. Um, speaking of things that are a lot worse, how about we do a five-word review? Um, oh, it's, if everybody's okay. Andrew's uh, doing a little technical difficulty. So, uh, Joe, if you want to lead us off, if you want, with a five-word review, if you have one. Yeah, yeah, I've got one. Um, it's probably is wrong because it's. I tried going with a, more of a naval term thing here. Um, I said 40 knots of rough seas for this one. Okay. And not because like, it's, it's not because it's a bad movie. It's a really good movie. And I, I actually stole the, that from, um, it was a review of one of Ridley Scott's friends for aliens. And he said it was 40 miles of bad road, uh, oh, wow. for the movie. And so it's just because I feel like in this, like me just watching this, all I things like, man, I am so glad I was never in the Navy in the Napoleonic area okay. <laughs> because like, I mean, they're, they're patching the ship up as they're like sailing. Like, no, 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 we're not porting. We're just going to do it while we're going. Like what sort oh, of yeah. crazy is that? Everything just keeps going from like almost was like bad to worse from them. And it just feel like they're, they're completely outclassed and outgunned by this newer ship. Their ship is falling apart. They're having to put together. People are dying left and right. And like, yeah, yeah. Being in the Navy sucks, man. Um, but good movie. Oh, and Russell Russell Crowe is basically an eighteen or a, an eighteen hundreds Bill O'Reilly. You know, he just says we'll do it live. He ripped off his jacket, yeah. and it's like, mm-hmm. yep, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> yeah, we have to port. No, we're doing it live. Yeah, I don't know what it means, but we're doing it live. That's right. I like it. <laughs> what does that mean? Sail us out. What What does that mean? <laughs> sail us out. To sail us out. <laughs> wow. I gotta admit, I don't. I don't think I could have uh, ever predicted Bill O'Reilly's would be uh, uh, <laughs> up, uh, appearing on this show to, uh, ever. Uh, but that's nice. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll, we'll sail us out. What does that mean? I like it. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, okay, Mark, do you have one? I sure do. Mine's a little bit simpler, and it's actually a term that we want to use for our show to describe uh, certain actors and their. Their, their heydays, but I went with the golden age of Crow because this was really, this was like the, the time when this guy was just making bangers left and right, you know? I mean, 
it's kind of like the equivalent of uh oh i don't know if like if you guys remember usher the r&b artist in the in the 90s early 2000s that guy could fart through a walkie talkie into a microphone and he'd win a grammy oh so and, i was confused i thought you were referring to usher of the <laughs> ludicrous uh team up that he had <laughs> yeah for the well, great yeah, song yeah Mm-hmm. basically but that's that's what russell crowe did in this this time period the the early 2000s maybe a little bit of the late 90s i mean uh he played these charismatic characters who you know didn't have many dimensions to them but they were good the ones he would pick usually stuff you can attach to as a moviegoer so yeah a lot of value i think in in his ability to 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 harness that okay yeah um. Yeah, I mean, you're not. Yeah, Russell Crowe is. Uh, gosh, he was. Let's say this is a few years after. You know, Gladiator and A Beautiful Mind. Beautiful Mind. Yep. Um. Yeah, he was. He yeah, was, rolling in the deep at yeah, this point. Yeah. yeah, he was. This was his stuff. I mean, I, when was I, his Robin Hood? Um, uh, it was more that would recent, be two thousand eight. Two thousand eight. I think two thousand ten. Okay, so oh, not that much more recent. Okay. So a little bit later, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I liked that movie. By the way, I I, liked, I did too. I like it. Rid- Ridley Scott movie. Um, if you watch the theater or the director's cut, it's it's a little better. Yeah, it um, is. Same thing, and I've I've said this. If you've listened, if you're listening to this show because you're a cheap seat fan, you've heard me say this probably fifty times. But if you're here for a digital dissection, this will be your, the first time hearing this. Go watch. Kingdom of Heaven, the director's cut. I'm telling oh, you, yeah. it's a three-hour-long movie, but it's so good, and it's so, it's a different movie. It is it is a different movie. I mean, it is as yeah. different as Justice League versus Justice League Zack Snyder cut. Oh, okay, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now the difference being is that oh, this is going to turn this is going to ruffle some feathers. <laughs> I I didn't hate the Joss Whedon version of Justice League. I didn't hate it. I thought it was fine. But I also I didn't either. I don't yeah. love. Batman. I don't love Warner Brothers or uh, DC. Is what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. I don't love those movies. Um, so the like the the Zack Snyder one I thought was better, but the bar wasn't very high, so it didn't. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like I was, oh, yeah. I was good either way. Yeah, Peter's gonna hate Sean. <laughs> yeah, I know that's fine. But like, whereas in this movie, it, like it really felt like the theatrical version of Kingdom of Heaven is a is okay, but the director's cut is a really good movie. So. Go yeah, watch I mean, it, I'm saying. I mean, I feel like that's like the Lord of the Rings too. Like the Lord of the Rings are really good movies, but then the director's cuts are very good movies. Are you maybe, comparing maybe the Lord? High. You're comparing the Lord of the Rings to the Justice League right now? No, 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 no. I am saying <laughs> that like no. like scaling up from like the, I have from the standard <laughs> to like the, the extended cut. Yeah, I, I w- guess I, I should have said like. And it, it's an extended cut that's actually worth the extended cut or the extra yeah, is. stuff is what I yeah. mean to say. Yeah. Not, I mean, cause like, like justice league and the Snyder cut are two almost completely different movies. They kind where, of are. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas like, like I'm guessing like with kingdom of heaven, it's like the, the theatrical cut is fine and it's good, but it's the a, extended it's a, cut ad, is like the actual added stuff or the stuff that was put back in is makes it really good. Yeah, uh, yeah, to to give it um numerical equations, you know, it'd be like if Kingdom of Heaven theatrical is a 5, the director's cut makes it an 8. Whereas like Lord of the Rings, the the, the theatrical cut Lord of the Rings is an 8 and then the director's cut makes it like a 9.5. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Like, like a perfect yeah. 5 out of 7. Yeah, it yeah. also makes it 9.5 hours longer, but <laughs> it does make it long. <laughs> it's worth it. It's worth it. It is. I mean, I saw they did a, a Phantom events. I don't know if you guys have that, oh, like yeah. uh, Regal or AMC, whoever does. Mm-hmm. So Sam yeah. and uh, Sam, who is with the podcast with us, and Cornelius, who also used to be on the show, uh, the three of us sat through the Return of the King, the director's cut, and in a theater for all four oh. hours in a theater. Um, mm-hmm. I'm just going to be honest. That theater was ripe. It smelled. <laughs> it was 100 percent packed. We were in the last row, and by the time you got to the 11th ending, because that movie has 11 endings, um, <laughs> it was ripe in that room. I'm just going to be honest, because everyone in there was a dude. <laughs> just just like this movie, there were no women in that room. So imagine the uh-huh. smell of that ship. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, I can. Yeah. I was in that theater. Yeah. <laughs> Just a little bit less salty, you know, salt uh, air. It's like before one we hour ha- into an anime convention. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Hey, before we actually get into the movie, yeah. something I wanted to say about this, this is something that I just committed to memory a long time ago. For some reason, this movie required 400 pounds of hair that the actors wore. For this movie? This movie. That's a weird bit of trivia. Okay. That is odd. Oh, yeah. They, they like, shaved most of it off of Russell Crowe's back. and <laughs> <laughs> He charged for that, by the He's way. He's a hairy strength. man. <laughs> well he will have vengeance in this life or the next so i'll stay out of his way <laughs> yeah 400 pounds of hair what do you do with that much hair you know i don't know that's i don't a, know that's, i mean there's that one guy who had like his head like scalped off for surgery yeah but that's so only he using, wasn't using it yeah that, that's at best i mean if he shaved his head he's using 60 percent of that surface i mean yeah. you don't need 400 pounds for that no, I mean, in that scene also, I don't know if I'm, I'm going ahead, where they were actually doing surgery on the guy and all the all the, the semen are just gathered around. Like, it's like one of those, um, I don't know, like one of those um, public, like, forums where, like, colleges yeah. or universities will have, like, people watch the surgeries. Yeah. It was like yeah. that. Thankfully, no one, you know, put a junior mint, like, into that guy as they were, <laughs> oh, God. They were working know. on him. I don't think yeah. I've ever had that. Not many semen staring at me before. Oh. Okay. Oh, it's it's got to be riveting. It's got to be. And you have to perform while you're down there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you got to deliver. They well, want the goods. I, have, I can't add to the joke. I was trying to think something about the coin because they stick a coin in his head. Yeah, uh, as of a all the to, weird tools, yeah. Well, I mean, it kind of makes sense that, you know, it's metal, right? And so it'll probably graft, the skin will graft around it. And the mm-hmm. bone will kind of adhere to it. I mean, I guess it kind of makes sense. It's just like there's 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 a joke in there now that he's worth a dollar or something. I can't think mm-hmm. of what the the joke is, but there's <laughs> you know. But, but just imagine well, like well, yeah. modern day, like in a surgery, the doctor's like asking for tools: scalpel, scalpel, bone saw, bone saw, quarter, coin, coin, coin. yeah, coin. <laughs> yes, doctor. Well, you see, Clark, uh, if if I get hit there, my hair just won't part. The way that it's supposed to. <laughs> yeah, you can't be anywhere near a microwave, by the way, when you've got yeah. that, that in your head. I think you'll be okay with it as far as that goes. Um, yeah. have, I guess I never asked the question, or I haven't yet, I should say. Did any of us, have we all seen this movie before this viewing? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I saw this one in, in theaters. Wow. Uh, yeah. I decided to actually go out and see it, mostly because I think I was uh, kind of following the success of Russell Crowe, like you mentioned. He had a a couple Academy Awards under his belt. And so people are kind of wondering, like, is this guy going to do it again? Is mm-hmm. this going to be Academy Award winning? And then you get to this movie, and it's like, yeah, he was great, but uh even as a fanboy, I I can't I can't extend the logic to this one. Just just not possible. Andrew, you look like you're about to say something. I can't what well, you have not seen this before, yeah. right? It's the first time. Nice. Yeah. So it's it's one of those that I wanted to see when it came out, and uh, I just never got around to doing it. Uh, but I did, and you could probably understand why, run across the soundtrack tons of times uh, throughout my 13 years of teaching music. So but this is the first time seeing it. I'm glad you mentioned soundtrack, because I want to talk about that for a second. So uh, this was... This was my first time all the way through from f- from opening credits to ending credits. This is one of those movies that I've seen the middle hour probably three times. You know, like I always show up after the first battle. So like the kids already missing an arm and mm-hmm. they're already mm-hmm. under they're already in the, the the you know in like 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 repair mode, right? They're fixing the ship. Yeah, and what is that stump if not his limb enduring, really? Ah, I was waiting for the <laughs> waiting for the one division reference. Sure. I was going to use one. <laughs> but damn, he beat you to it. it. Um, and then I always, for some reason, I didn't get to finish. Uh, basically, after the Galapagos Island scene, the doctor gets mm-hmm. shot, um, and then Which, <laughs> I keep going. That scene like drove me mad. Like, what do you? Well, there, there's uh, a reason. There's a reason why that scene's in the movie. There's a. Mm-hmm. There's, there's a. It's parallel. because of. Well, it's because of uh, 
the vice president uh, for George Bush. What was his name? Uh, oh, yeah, Dick Cheney. Dick Cheney. Dick Cheney. Cheney. It's was, because of that. That's why they put that there. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the, the actual reason is that it's a parallel to the, the, the rhyme of the ancient mariner. You know, they're, they're, on, oh, a, yeah. they're on a boat. They see an albatross. The albatross uh, brings good luck. They kill the albatross. They have bad luck. In this case, there's a, they're on the boat. The, a guy literally says, there's your albatross. While trying to look at it, the guy tries to shoot it, and in attempting to try to shoot it, hits the doctor, therefore ensuring bad luck. And that's why you're not supposed to shoot River Tam either. There's yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah the way I hear Albatross was a ship's good luck till some idiot killed it. Yes, yeah. try not to faint. Yeah. I've read a book. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm glad you. I'm glad you brought up the bird, the Albatross, real quick because I forgot to mention Sam in every episode. Oh yeah, How tries we, to kill you. Yeah, and. In this episode, Sam would uh, hold the mirror for you as you operated on yourself, but never hold it where you could actually see what you're doing. <laughs> so I like, I can't see Sam, and I clip an artery or something. Yeah, exactly. Gosh, yeah, that's that's <laughs> dastardly and clever. Okay. Um, so back to a uh, previous little, little bit. Andrew mentioned the, the the soundtrack, the score. And we are, Andrew, you haven't done your five word, and I haven't done mine. So we'll do, right? Oh. Yeah, we'll do ours in just a second. Uh, so I was click. I was looking for the score. Who 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 wrote the score? Because I remember liking it, thinking this is pretty good music. I I kind of like this. And so obviously the the cello and violin part. That's all you know. Classical written music from you know they didn't write that for the movie, right? Um, those that's all other stuff. So when I'm when I click on um, you know music. This movie has three composers. Oh, wow. Iva hmm. Davies, Christopher Gordon, and Richard Tognetti. And so Iva Davies, when you click on him, who, by the way, he has a great picture of him in a mullet. <laughs> Seriously, click on Iva Davies, I-V-A-D-A-V-I-E-S. I mean, that is, that is mullet city. <laughs> um, he is mostly known for... Wow. Um, he wearing did, uh, wearing a lot of denim. Well, as a composer, he did Ice House. Hey, little like there was a band I guess called Ice House, and he is in Ice House. Hmm. He's in the band, huh. so he mostly did their music videos, uh, as well as this movie. I mean, it's just weird. Wow. Yeah. I wonder if he did a lot of the uh, sea chant sea shanty like singing parts you know maybe so then you got christopher gordon Uh, um who has done such fine movies as uh he was the composer for such things as well this movie and i don't know i'm looking for some stuff you would ever have heard of he was the conductor for mortal Kombat, but he wasn't the composer he did something called The Walrus and the Oyster, Buckley's Chance, June Again, Ladies in Black, Out of the Shadows, Crawl, My, uh, Mao's Last Dancer, Daybreakers. I've at least heard oh. of Daybreakers. Mao's Last Dancer. Yeah, I know Daybreakers. that one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Daybreakers is pretty solid, too. And then the yeah. last guy, Richard Tognetti, uh, who is from New, New South Wales, composer. He did, this was his first movie, and then did three movies, something called Storm Surfers, Dangerous Banks, all documentaries, and then something called Mountain, Mountain Quest, and River. Like, these are three kind of unknown dudes doing a $100 million movie. Yeah. yeah. And huh. and they did a fine job, but, like, obviously they're no Hans Zimmer, or, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, now that's unfair, because this is the same year that Pirates of the Caribbean came out. Right? Do you yeah. think that? Do you think that's why they used a lot of classical music that was already written? And you know, because and and by the way, the stuff that they chose was fantastic. I mean, the the Bach uh, cello suite well, or the yeah. cello thing is w- wonderful, yeah. and it's played like at everybody's wedding everywhere. But yeah. well, every uh, cello player worth their salt knows that. I mean, exactly. I mean, and I don't know if you noticed, but if you take a cello. And pop it up on its side. Chilo, you got a bass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's a school of rock reference. Yeah. 
Uh, That's wonderful. I, I just think they used. I just think that they used that movie to give it some more authenticity, to kind of to to remind you of the time period, and to to give it. I just like it because it kind of gives those two characters a little bit of depth, and that it does. Yeah, yeah, you know, like these are two men. One man is a man of war, a man of action, a man of decision, and the other is a doctor who's a man of science and um, and order and you know, who wants to question things. Why do we do this thing? And he's also kind of the audience, right? He gets to ask questions. Oh, what is this thing? So that the guy can say, oh, this is why we're excited because of this, so that we, the audience, know what's happening. But he's, a, he's also kind of like his moral compass in yes, a way. Yes, moral yeah. compass is perfect example. Exactly. Yeah. But well, then at the end of the day, yeah. they still get to be friends and play music, which is... You know what I'm saying? Like this this movie, instead of them playing chess like some other movies would have them do, or they just get drunk and fight, these guys are musicians, which I think is just frankly lovely. I really like it. I do. Well, and to add depth to that relationship that you see on screen, so Tognetti actually taught Russell Crowe how to play the violin, Mm -hmm. and then Paul Bettany actually learned how to play the cello as well so that the scenes looked organic. Yeah. Because yeah, he, and they did a great job. Andrew and I are both musicians. Yeah. I don't know about either one of you gentlemen, but Andrew and I are both musicians. Uh, Andrew teaches music for a living, and I have played, you know, I've been paid to play once or twice. So we're hyper aware of when actors are faking it because it looks yeah. terrible. <laughs> and it's, it's, yeah. so, it's so jarring when, it's, when you're faking it. And, you know, for, for, uh, for us, it's like, okay, just don't even have the camera on them if you're not going to. You know, it's just, just move the camera away. Like, oh, the Hungry Eyes music theater has to drive you two up the wall then. <laughs> the what? Have you never watched the uh, the music video for Hungry Eyes from the Dirty Dancing soundtrack? No. I don't think I have. Oh, yeah. The woman playing the saxophone <laughs> will, will enrage you. So when oh, you get nice. a chance, <laughs> just, just, just Hungry Eyes on YouTube. You're, you'll have a great time. And I, I think anybody that has played an instrument can understand just how difficult it really is. And so for an actor to do this, it reminds me of uh, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. With, yeah. Uh, uh, Chadwick, Chadwick Boseman. Boseman. Yeah. Learning to play the trumpet, uh, which is not easy if you've never done it before. You know, and, and playing the violin or cello is not either. And maybe they had some prior chops. Maybe they played it when they were younger. But From the trivia I read, they had to learn it. They wanted to learn it for the part so that it would be authentic. Now, I, I don't know what it takes to teach someone who is an adult that, you know, I mean, Andrew, you and I have had many, many years of training to get to where we are. Now, obviously what we're hearing is not what they're producing in the, in the moment, obviously, because right. we're hearing very good sound and what they probably were producing probably sounded like shit, but, um, <laughs> I was, I was going to say they dubbed it, it over for the final yeah, version. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, it was all screeching and scratching and nothing you could dance to. I love that. I love how the cook was just so <laughs> yeah. grumpy about the whole thing. He's just like, oh, like he hated it. He hated it. Oh. All. And they go screeching and scratching. It's like, can you not just like, like his whole mood, the whole movie was just to be comic relief grump. Pretty know? much, uh-huh. yeah. And I love like yeah. the amount of times like they just like completely like little like Keelik just gets like I don't know belittled or put in his place. Like, even like the whole like uh, when you get the the two kids come in with the model of the uh, the Acheron, mm-hmm. he's like, oh no, I watched it be built in 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 the states or whatever, and here's what it looks like. And like extra rations of rums for these two, and he's like, well, I was saving it for service days. Like you'll have wine, <laughs> yeah, I'll have wine, we'll have yeah. wine. <laughs> like like it seems like a dude who's been with the captain long enough that he is allowed to say things like that. Yep. You know, right. like like when oh, they yeah. call for him and he's already there and he's like, "Kill!" He's like, "I'm already here." Oh, okay. You know, just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. he was funny. He was funny. Uh, Andrew, go ahead and uh, lay down your five word. Okay. Well, I've actually it's a seven word, uh, but it's two conjunctions, so it's like nine. So whatever. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't need romance if you got a bromance. Okay. Uh, and just do through days. Yeah, I mean this. This was a. It was a very simple story. I mean, in all actuality, there's not uh, too much happening here, but it's a story less to me about exploring and adventure than it is about you know having your 
your friend that you're learning to to exist with out on the water and and helping each other find their way and and it's a kind of a character development type story rather than a, a true adventure. Yeah, there was some action at the beginning and at the end, pretty much. Um, but overall, that's what it was to me. Um, the the characters that are not Paul Bettany and uh, Russell Crowe, they're kind of forgettable. Yeah, and I don't know if it's because there's so many people and they they all look kind of the same because you, you can't really make them special in any way. They're pirate, or not pirate, but they're seamen. And, well, uh, I mean, Crow did have the big hat. He that's that. true. Yeah, but everyone else had the same sideburns, which made things very right. complicated. And honestly, yeah, there were a few times I was like, is that the same guy that I just... Yeah, so I did get confused. I mean, we have some of those, the children or teenage actors. I don't know what age they were, but those you care about a little bit. Um, you know, you meet the boy at the beginning, and my God, the sound of the saw just... And this brave kid biting down on this uh, leather or stick or whatever this was as his arm is being removed from his body. Uh, uh, the sound, though, just made me cringe. Um, the it was th- really the tough more- to laugh at that part, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it was really, really yeah. tough. I, I, was- I, got, I managed to laugh, but it was tough. It was not easy. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to like, even just add it to you. Like, I'm usually annoyed by most children and acting in movies just because they can't. Yeah. And they're not going to spend money on teaching the children to act. Uh, but right. the children in this movie, actually, I thought all did a really, really good job. Yeah, they were that, very that believable me. what they did. Yeah, I'm right there with you. What was the movie we just did with the child actor that I was like, yeah, the same thing. He, well, last he didn't week, annoy me. Yeah, last week we did Real Steel with the little boy. Oh, oh I love that's right. Real Steel. Such yeah, a great that's, movie. That, that little guy is a great actor. He was good. Uh, he but, was good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But these guys, yeah, I agree with you. They, they didn't bother me and did a good job. But to get back to my point, though, when the older one, spoiler, died at the end, I didn't really care. Um, and all the people that, that were killed, I didn't even really know who they were. Um, so you don't really care about those characters. And I don't know that we're meant to. But um, And then one other thing that kind of bothered me, and maybe it's just me and my, you know, fantasy, fairy tale, Disney-esque type movies that I've been used to. We never actually see the antagonist. Like, yeah. we see the ship but we have no clue what's happening on that ship. We know nothing about those people until the very end. And even then we just see them die. We don't know anything about them. Um, so I, yeah. I don't, I don't know if I like that or if I don't, I'm kind of, yeah. I'm kind of on the fence. I personally loved it. Personally. I loved it because the, the movie is about these men on their voyage and to give us the point of view of the French would probably change some things maybe i don't know i just i this is based on a novel i don't know if that's been said here yeah. this movie is based on actually several novels and in fact this movie was intended to be the kickstart of a franchise Ooh. which is Ooh. that's why the movie technically ends on a cliffhanger and so this they were supposed to make more they didn't make enough money you know if this makes 500 million dollars then they'll make a second one but um, but I personally like Which, that. I, I, I like the idea. But, but to be very most specific, if we spend any time on the French boat, then the the trick that happens at the end, we it doesn't it doesn't work because we know who the captain is. So yeah, I I, I, I personally think, liked it. But what's weird about this movie, though, especially with how long it runs. You you don't like we've talked about before. Now there's a lot of of empty space where we're not actually building on characters here. Mm-hmm. Like like the the supporting cast are almost they're almost left to be a mechanical existence. They're only here to serve out some very specific functions, and we don't do anything else with them. So as they shed them at points, I mean there is no attachment. You're just like, well, not yep. seeing that guy oh, again. Going. Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So really, the 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 film's focus is pretty much between 
uh, Crow and Betany. That's that's where all the you know the throwaway exposition happens. That's where uh, that's where the majority of the conflict happens outside of them chasing down the French the whole time. Yeah, and I guess like uh, to comment on like Andrew, I, I I'm on Andrew's side too with this too. Like when I don't have like a face to hate, or not not to hate, but you know, like when you don't have a really like spelled out or fleshed out antagonist, it is hard to like get into a movie because then it's like you know what's the point of doing all this? And it turns out the point of doing all this is because they're under orders. <laughs> old, um, did your cat just like break dishes or something? <laughs> my cat is going to die tonight. <laughs> Mine is last life. Oh my God. Just, if, just go ahead. Go ahead and put that anywhere. I, yep. I mean, like if it wasn't for the fact that it's in the middle of Joe talking, I could edit that out, but I mean like right in the middle of your thing, like good <laughs> Lord. <that> was. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> wait, 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 hold on. Hold on. Andrew, be very careful. Stone Cold Steve Austin may be in your home. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Or the Kool Aid Man just broke through. I don't know what just happened. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Damn. Uh, sorry, sorry, Joe. I, I, yeah. I, oh I, no, it's totally I, cool. <laughs> cat not well, only I, broke the dishes, but your train of thought. No, it's totally cool. Like I was just saying, like I I completely agree with Andrew. When you don't have an antagonist in any capacity, um, it's hard to like buy into movies. Like, because what's the point of them doing this? Yeah. And it kind of turns out like they're doing it basically because they're under orders. And even it gets yeah. to a point where um, they have to leave the Galapagos early. And Paul Bettany's character is like, well, hey, you said we we're going to be here for days, not hours. And he's trying to argue his point. And then Russell Crowe just gets mad and interrupts and says, we don't have time for your hobby. I'm under orders. Like that's that's kind of what you're what, what you're dealing with here. But at the same time. I don't really care about his orders because yeah. yeah, you've got to capture this ship or sink it. Uh, but we don't hate the captain on it. We don't hate the crew. We know it's kind of going around sinking wealthy, um, uh, merchants, but we only know that because we were casually paying attention at the right time. Uh, for the exactly. movie to figure that out. So it, that to me, it's almost like the same thing as like having a, like a, like a bad villain. And by bad, like you don't care about the villain, like Ghostbusters 2016, crappy villain who's just a villain for the sake of being a villain you don't mm-hmm. care about him you don't attach to him he doesn't feel like a threat you don't like he's poorly written and it's the same thing here i don't have someone to hate or someone who can actually push the protagonist forward other than the protagonist just kind of pushing themselves so it is hard in that sense to to buy into the movie when there's no no villain or someone to hate here right i don't know why i i'm thinking about the movie the patriot but yeah, if you think because about, it's the most historically accurate film ever made. Uh, yeah, of course, yeah. You have to um, bring up the Patriot. Film just but, down I mean, the street from where I live. Yeah. <laughs> nice. But you think about how much you really hate oh. the antagonist in oh, those, yeah. in that movie compared to this where you're like, I, I don't know who you're chasing, yeah. but good luck. Yeah, well, no, like, I've, I've talked about Jason Isaacs in other um, things too, who played the antagonist in, in the Patriot. And yeah. again, like he, he is really smart with picking his roles because he only wants to be believable people, especially his villains. And in mm-hmm. the Patriot, one thing, the, the scene where he rides the horse into the church and uh, like basically says, he can come back and burn this, burn this mother down. Uh, that was his idea <laughs> to ride the horse in. And they actually had to um, remove the, like, well, there's, there's no room for you to actually ride it on the horse in those doors. And he's like, well, how about we just remove them and reshoot this scene like days later. And the director's like, yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. Just do that. And it made the set people so mad that they had to do that and change the doors <laughs> on the thing. But they did it and it, it worked out like phenomenally. Cause that's an awesome scene in that movie. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to parse out here what, what you, the, you guys were saying. And here's where I think, personally is the disconnect with the hero versus the antagonist. Yes, we never we never meet the antagonist. I think part of it also, and this might sound small-minded, but I think part of it that the four of us are American dudes and we don't care about the French. And I know we have a couple of British <laughs> listeners or English, I said I don't know if you're British, I guess you're English. I guess if you're part of the British whatever, I don't know. Anyway, my point is is that it's not our history. Right, it's 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 their history. The in mm-hmm. the in the book in the original book, the the fight actually is between a, a, the British and an American because uh, it's it's during the eighteen twelve uh, war of eighteen twelve. Mm. 
Okay. And so it's actually between an American frigate um, and a uh, and the French or the British. And they kept that part of the in the movie when they said it's a French boat, but built in Boston. So yeah. that's how they're able to keep some of that that part of the part of the movie. So the fact that it's French and we don't really care, maybe that's part of it. Um, the the Patriot, I think, is a great example of we need a, a singular villain for the hero to have uh, a, a thing, because in that particular movie, the the hero is not following orders; he is following revenge. Um, that's a revenge movie yeah. that just happens to take place during uh, a fictional version of the American Revolution. But we have seen other movies like Saving Private Ryan. They're fighting mm-hmm. the Germans. We don't know any Germans. They're they're just all bad. And we're okay with that. The only singular German we get is that one guy that stabs the other guy and then Oppum shoots later. Um, he's the only one that we spend any time with. So we know that the Americans, we hate the Germans, but we hate the Germans because they're Nazis and the Americans were there to save the day. So I think that might be part of it, maybe. I don't know. Maybe. I think... Picture this for a moment. If this movie were a rated R movie, and we at the beginning we we see the captain's best friend, other than the doctor, maybe he's got his, both of, both both of his best friends on the boat with him there. Ship, sorry, and a cannonball just like impales this guy, knocks him off the ship. I don't know, kills his friend. He has a reason, a personal reason, like. He's not just following orders. Then he's got a personal vendetta, and he's got the orders to follow. So, but then, it, then it's a Jean Claude Van Damme movie at that it point because that's how every <laughs> that's how every Jean Claude Van Damme movie works. That's well, true. there's there's the movie kind of does a little bit of the Moby Dick trope, right? Where I have to uh, I, whatever it takes, I have to defeat the enemy, and eventually yeah. it, he gets reined in because of the friendship with the doctor. And I feel like to me, that's really great. Kind of the, the character development where the captain makes a choice um, because the, 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 you know, there's probably a version of, of a, of a British captain that would say one man is not worth, you know, the war, you know, we have to win the war and I can't stop just to help my friend. Whereas in this case, he made the choice, know what, we're going to go and get the doctor better because not only is he the doctor, but he's also, um, okay. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, I got distracted. Uh, Joe is in a legitimate dangerous situation right now and he has to go to the basement of his house. So, yeah, it's storm season up here in yeah. Wisconsin. Yeah, he's in yeah. a he's in a bad way. So we're gonna keep going because he told me ahead of time if I have to leave, just keep going. So we're gonna just keep chugging on with the show. Uh, yeah, but, he's he's live live tweeting from the basement. So if he does uh, expire on us, we'll know in real time, <laughs> and I'll just fine. update everyone here. So it'll it'll be fine. <laughs> well, we are we are looking at his live feed here. So. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my god. I, I hate to, honestly I hate to joke about it but before we uh <laughs> did the show tonight he's like there's a point where I may have to leave and uh I will update you guys on that. So we we wish the best to him and uh yeah, absolutely, hate to yeah. make light of it but yeah we're under the same watch here where I am we just haven't actually seen a tornado yet so That's good times. Yeah, I just yeah, that 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 stuff shit whatever I'm going to try to say is scary especially to Andrew and I because we don't have that here. Oh. Now, right. we have hurricanes, but we know they're coming for a week. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, we have a week to prepare, and nine times out of ten, they don't get where we live. They just don't come here. They skip off and go back out in the ocean, or just they park over Florida or Georgia or whatever. In North Carolina, it's like, you know, whatever. We don't have what you have. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So I'm just going to take this uh, awkward opportunity to give you my five-word review, because uh, there's really <laughs> no way to transition from that to this. And well, I will. I have two. I don't usually do two, but I actually have two. My my kind of funny one, uh, and I'm cheating because I know a lot is not one word, but right now it's one word. Children have a lot of power. Okay, um, I just that's it, very true. <laughs> yeah, it just. Yeah. I mean, that kid that killed. I say kid that killed himself. He's thirty, but he looks like he's twelve. Uh, the one with yeah. what killed himself, the Jonah. But the other one I just wrote simply, epic sailing across the world. 
Um, yeah. 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 Fair. I mean, I, and to your point, Sean, about that, I mean, the junior officers are basically the ones who spot the man of war in the very beginning of the movie. Yeah. They have to make the judgment call. Is that what that actually is? Um, which I think was, there's a really odd balancing of stakes at the very beginning of the movie because you don't know if you're supposed to be afraid yet. You don't know if you're supposed to be intimidated by what this is, but the ominous nature of that and putting it on the kid's shoulders. Yeah. It was a really interesting way to start that movie. It, it, it's also just a really interesting dynamic. Just thinking about it in today's terms, you know, I mean, the, the guy that's making the call, the guy that's the officer on the deck. Now again, he's 30, right? He's not a child. He's 30. But he looks like a kid. But the the guy that makes the decision is we don't we're never given his age. But I can't. He doesn't look a day over eighteen or seventeen. Oh yeah, <laughs> he's the one that actually makes the call and then gives credit to the other guy, saying, "Well, he called to orders because he saw a thing." And um, it's just really an interesting idea that we're giving that they would give you know, them that, that much power. Now on the flip side of that, I say that, and I know that right now there are 19 year olds, you know, piloting aircraft carriers, you know, I yeah. mean, you know, these, these are enlisted men oh, yeah. in our Navy that are pilots and, and stuff like that. But you know, again, but, but what the kid, what lost his arm, he's what, 10, <laughs> you know, <laughs> he hadn't, yeah. he hadn't hit puberty. Is my point, and yeah. uh, so and he was giving orders there at the end. To yeah, fire cannon. He was you know? not only did he give an, he gave orders, he gave good orders that were strategically sound. Yeah, you know? yeah. But he looked down and was like, "They're gonna shoot up at us, so let's lift the back of the cannon." I mean, there are men lifting the cannon so that when it fires, it fires down, and then he's not. Then he so he kills those men and then uses. The damage to go into, he leads them into the boat, fires his pistol, and pulls out a sword with his left hand and goes to work. Like, my gosh, that kid was was he was kind of awesome. Um, that's yeah, our dad moment right there. Yeah, yeah that's. that's <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm so proud. My son murdered eleven uh, Frenchmen <laughs> with one arm. That boy had one arm, and he killed all those guys. That's right. Yeah. Oh my god. Crowd pop a moment. Yeah. <laughs> there was, and honestly, there was a moment where, when we see the older boy that was kind of in charge of rescuing the uh, the other uh, sailors, when we the the when they have the men, they're kind of looking down, sad, and then the camera reveals it was him. I yeah. honestly thought it was going to be the young kid, like he uh-huh. was dead with like eleven dead Frenchmen around him. Like this kid had taken out all these Frenchmen around him, but they eventually got him. I thought yeah. that was what was going to happen because to me that's the emotional blow. Yeah, that that was the same for me. I, I really expected it to be him. Yeah, but again, they thought this movie was going to make they were going to make you know three more of these movies or whatever. So I guess they wanted him to be have a more of a prominent role. And that could be you know now that you say that that could be why maybe some of the the supporting actors and characters weren't introduced or weren't used as much, you know. Because maybe they had planned on using them in the second or third installment. It could be a little yeah. more. Yeah, the the Pippin guy, you know, uh, Billy Boyd. You know, he was the he, he he drove the ship the most. I think he was on the wheel. I think the majority of the time. I mean, maybe he gets a little bit more more work. I mean, you're right. I think there's there's the anticipation. What other movie did we watch recently where they anticipated making more movies, but because it was so poorly received, we did that recently. I thought. Yeah, there was something, but I'm blanking on it right now. Um, well, yeah. anyway. there's something that something that kind of struck me a little odd about this, though, because uh, the the narrative choices are a little weird. Even though, yeah, it's supposed to be a continuation, but I mean, the movie was a pretty much a personal project of a Fox executive, which is a it's kind of a weird choice, right? Because why would you make a personal project out of something that you know, has a literary following, you know, I mean, like this would be before like 10 years before adapting a book into a movie was almost a go ahead. Right. It's like, yeah, if this, if this book's made some money, let's put it on the screen. Well, when you start making the choices of, uh, establishing clearly 
the the social aspect of the ship and how it operates and how the crew is rougher around the edges, even though they're technically part of the Navy. None of them feel that way, right? Like they, they did a good job establishing that, but then any other relationships really outside of, um, you know, like uh, giving the young officer without his arm a book, you know, trying to bond with him, stuff like that. Those moments were sparse. It just didn't happen very much. So it felt odd when you would get pulled in from the action to do some of these, you know, these, uh, I don't know, half-assed attempts at uh, story building. I don't know. Yeah, and I think that, I think it kind of made the film boring at times. Yeah. You know? uh, because we talked about the writing a little bit, and or maybe we did. Did we talk about the writing? Not really. Um, you know, the the writing of the story, I don't know how much it follows the book at all, but... Um, so this technically follows two books. So this, oh. the reason why it's called Master and Commander, The Far Side of the World, is because the first book called Master and Commander, and then like the fifth book is called The Far Side of the World. So they've combined oh, some of the story elements from two different books. Gotcha. Uh, and according to the trivia, it follows that storyline pretty closely, and there's a lot of, not a lot, there are some Easter eggs that are placed throughout the movie for readers of the book to go, oh... Um, like when there's a line when he says, how do they know where we are? And, and, uh, he's, uh, Russell Crowe says, well, or no, uh, Paul Bettany says, well, they have spies just like we have spies in the book. He's a spy. Ah, uh, okay. Um, uh, yeah, I, the writing, I, what I was going to say, the writing, I don't think it was bad. I think it's fine and the dialogue's great, but I don't know if it's, we're, we're missing some action. Or, or there's so much dead time because there's only one place we are only on the ship, you know, until we get to the Galapagos for five minutes and then have to get back on the ship. Um, well, it's course. reminiscent. It's reminiscent of uh, if you've ever gotten uh, a McFlurry or a Blizzard from DQ and you get all of your toppings stuck at the top half and then it's just pure vanilla ice cream on the other half. Yeah. That's kind of the, the the nuance we get here, you know. You have you have these moments where these these large scale things happen, and then we're sitting around the table talking about weevils. Which which don't get me wrong, the weevils joke claps. It's great every time, but it, it just yeah, it kind of uh, when you do that multiple times in a movie, especially an action movie, you know, if you have uh, a short moment in a film, kind of like in uh, Saving Private Ryan, like you mentioned, they get out of D-Day, they finally get to Private Ryan and they're telling personal stories about back home. That fits because we have these like uh, these big moments that happen and we have to come down from them. So it makes sense. In this case, it's like, well, okay, you've got some action scenes, but then you've got so much time to calm down until the next one. Yeah, you're, you're snoozing by the time you get there. I will say this. Oh, oh sorry. Um, I'll say this. I wouldn't call this movie an action movie, uh, personally. Like Saving Private Ryan is a kind of you know is a war epic. Um, I, I guess for me, when I think action movie, I think like Die Hard or, um, I, I don't know. For me, this is just more of like just a big story. I don't know because because this movie only has really there's there's three action sequences, right? There's Really, like there's the opening battle, the closing battle, and then really the only next quote unquote action that happens is when they're getting chased uh, and they have to like go hide in the fog. And oh, that's the beginning when they have to. Um, yeah, yeah, they escape the fog in the beginning. Yeah, the, the second time when, that, they, yeah. when they set up the little mini boat and they have to escape and they do the little thing and then they get it behind them and then the storm. That's it. The storm is kind of your second quote unquote action and they have to make the hard choice and let that poor man drown down at the horn. Like those are really only three action sequences in the movie. I think personally, kind of hearing both of you talk about some of the things that don't work, like specifically Saving Private Ryan, like why that works. There's not a lot of one-on-one time with anyone else other than the captain and and the doctor. Now the book yeah. the book focuses them. the The book is about those two men and their relationship, um, and and their friendship and that. I mean, it's it's a book about those two guys. So. 
so to your point specifically, like we don't care about when some of these other guys die because we haven't spent a lot of time with them alone. The only the only one on one pairing we get of anyone else on the boat besides the captain and the doctor is the doctor and the boy. The little boy who he's kind of grooming to be, you know, a naturalist like him. Otherwise, everyone is in a group setting. Everyone. And I yeah. made I made the joke earlier about, you know, to Andrew that he um close captioning saved my life in this movie. I watched this with closed captioning, and I'm so glad I did because there's about a third of the dialogue that's just yelling in the background <laughs> that's that, true. that I don't yeah. know if it was intention like you were supposed to really hear it, but it was really interesting to me because because not only was it some of it just sailing jargon, which I like, I don't know why I just like I like boat movies, I like movies <laughs> at water, so I like space movies. Um, yeah. Cause it's the same thing, you know, you're in the middle of the nothing and you have to get by with your grit and your guile and your boat and your love and whatever to, 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 you know, so she won't, you know, shake you as sure as a turn in the world to yeah. keep with the fire, sorry, uh, serenity quotes. But anyway, <laughs> um, oh, well, just, Sean, I don't want to cut you off, but like w- when you think about this film I, and I, I don't hate this film, by the way, I mean, I've owned it ever since I saw it in theaters. Um, I think what where it struggles a bit is that it, it is a pacing issue because you you get you get just like and it's not an action film it's an I guess action adjacent is probably the best way to put it I like that action um, adjacent it, it, yeah, yeah like they're like you're you're gonna get to things that are maybe a little faster paced um, but yeah it, it is the time that they spend not really expanding on anybody else and as much as we we get to know the, the Bettany and and Crow characters here. I mean, their relationship doesn't really advance beyond, you know, some standard squabbles that a lot of people have, right? Um, and and by the time that they get through these things, um, I think it's almost just a little too long in the tooth before you get to the next, you know, the next thing that's supposed to move us ahead, right? And but either way, that's that's kind of my take on it, and I've I've enjoyed this film, so it's weird for me to even be kind of criticizing it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you know my rule of movies, but one of my, well, one of my rules, the biggest one, in my opinion, is if it keeps your attention through the entire film, then I consider it a pretty good film. Uh, but if you're bored and you want to look away or you want to do other things or, you know, you you can't help but think about other things, then it's not keeping you. And I'm not saying all movies that I like are that way, but... This one, I did find myself drifting it. No, no pun intended, but I did find myself <laughs> drifting at times, uh, thinking about this or that, you know, while, while we were watching it. But, and also, Sean, to talk about uh, what you mentioned about the sound. Uh, so there was a, I had to watch this in segments and I was watching part of this in my vehicle, not while I was driving, but in my vehicle and I had it plugged up to the Bluetooth. So the sound was coming through my truck speakers and, uh, it was just the sound of the storm. And so all it's, it was like there was a storm outside my vehicle and it was pretty cool actually, um, to, to listen to the sound quality and, and hear all the little effects that were going on. Plus all that dialogue that was trying to be shouted over the, the sound of the storm. I mean, it, it. That's why I th- think the you have to kind of when you start to look at the budget of the movie, you almost have to pick it out and go, where do I think this money went? And I mean, I I agree with you that the score seems like there's some uh, some money put there, even though Russell Crowe had to buy his own violin for this movie. I don't know if y'all know that it was like a late 1800s violin that he purchased. Did you, <laughs> did you, did you see how much he sold it for, though? No, no. How much did he sell he it for? Sold it for seventy three thousand pounds. Wow. Oof. Good lord. I would just keep. Somebody it. had the money. I would. You know what I'm <laughs> I mean, I mean, he doesn't need the money, right? Not that Russell Crowe doesn't need the money. Keep that thing, man. That'd be so cool. Just to yeah, have. He's got. Ma- he's got Maximus Decimus Meridius money. He doesn't need to worry about that. Yeah, he's still collecting checks on that. 
All right. <laughs> so we do need to move on to the next segment of the show, and that is where I play clips. So I got some clips here. Not a lot. I got mm, four or so. No, yeah, not or so. I have really only four? Yeah, four clips. Um, so this first clip, you're going to have to forgive the audio quality. It's going to sound weird, but it's because it's one of those scenes where it's just someone yelling. So I did a little EQing so I so you can get rid of some of the ocean noise so you can kind of hear what he says. So I'm going to play it, see if you can hear what it says, and, and if you can't, then I'll just tell you what he says. Yeah, I just heard that there in my headset. There's no way you can understand what he says. Could you, could it you sounded it? like something from uh, Muppet's Treasure Island. Yeah. <laughs> I'll try it one more time, but uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. So even I know what he's saying, and it's hard to understand. But like with it, the with the wind and the actual like sound of the ocean, you again, closed captioning. So it's when they're trying to pull the boat, right? They're pulling the ship. Uh, into the fog and that's the the bosun screaming pull like you're pulling a frenchman off your mother (laughs) dude to be fair it sounded almost like uh like an action movie from the 80s that was filmed in japan and then dubbed in america like that's what that sounded like to me yeah i just i rolled off all the low end and a little bit of the high and boosted the middle just so i mean so it's why it sounds like it's coming through a cell phone but <laughs> believe it or not, the, the, the only reason why I knew that's what he's saying is because of the closed captioning. And I laughed. I did. I thought it was really funny. Um, that's great. Here's a good joke. To wives and to sweethearts. Wives and sweethearts. May they never meet. <laughs> there you go. That's a funny joke. <laughs> um, now, the intro, I, I, I chose the intro. I don't know why, but I love this, the language of, of that. Just when he's talking about the ship. I'm going to yeah. play it again. I just, I love this language. Surprise is not old. No one would call her old. She's a bluff bow, lovely lions. She's a fine seabird. I just, I love that language. I don't know why. But I, I don't know what it means, but I love it. I think it's very beautiful. Okay. Uh, you know, bluff lines and she's a wonder, beautiful seabird. I, just, I like that language. I really do. Okay. No, no innuendo. No, 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 but it's, it's very poetic though. Which, it is. Uh, yeah. yeah. It which is. I feel like we've gotten less and less poetic over the years. And, uh, you know, you tend to hear this too, especially in, well, ironically enough, Sean, in, in the Firefly series, but often when, uh, when you see about, um, like planes and and like Western exploration mm-hmm. kind of properties. That's when you hear this kind of stuff. It's usually always uh, a turn of the century type of conversation. So yeah, well, I, I I appreciate that too. Well, Sam, uh, if you're with us, uh, he has mentioned multiple times that the language of the Old West is as closest to Shakespeare as the Americas can get. Yeah. Um, so like, if you we watch True Grit for the show, and the just the way that especially Haley Steinfeld, the way she talks, it's, yeah. it's wonderful and it's beautiful language. And I wish we could talk like that more as a society and as a people. And Sam mentioned on that episode, it's American Shakespeare. It's as close as we can get to it. Um, not saying that it's the same quality. It's just that style, that very lyrical, um, uplifting, uh, colorful language. And I just love that yeah, language. Lot, I just really do. A lot of, a lot of analogies is what, what I found. Uh, yes. Yeah. But they just kind of roll off your tongue like molasses. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes. Here in the, in the South, everything rolls off the tongue like molasses. Uh, all right. Um, oh, wait. No, Joe, Joe almost came back and then walked away again. So I think he's, he's all good. There. Uh, I will play this clip. Uh, I think one of you mentioned it earlier, and here we go. Use the right-hand weevil. It has significant advantage in both length and breadth. There, I have you. You're completely dished. Do you not know that in the service, one must always choose the lesser of two weevils? I love it. It's so funny. I love the way Crow delivers the line. Like he's genuinely laughing at the joke. 
<laughs> yeah. It's almost yep. like he is he it's almost like nobody else was there for the script reading for that sequence and he's delivering it for the first time because the way he smirks at that it's like total grandpa vibes. Yeah. Like yeah. grandpa's been telling this joke for like 40 years and now he gets to tell it to people who've never heard it. Like I think at the like. very least he is a new father when he oh, makes yeah. this joke. Yeah. 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 Hey Joe, welcome back. Glad you're okay hey. and all that. Yeah, yeah, everything's fine. We've been We've been downgraded to a severe thunderstorm watch now. Now, I so, will admit morning. there was a moment mm-hmm. where the light, because you left your camera on, the light flickered mm-hmm. for a moment, and I thought, oh, shit. But I guess <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, everything, everything's fine. Great. Everything's okay. That's, that's good to hear. Glad to, glad to <laughs> have it. So, um, and uh, I'm just going to be honest with you, I'm not going to edit any of the part where I mentioned this out. So, uh, oh, people, okay. So a year from now, someone's going to be listening going, oh, my gosh, I hope he's okay. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I hope he pulled through fine for that tornado warning. Yeah. But, well, how, That's how, how we build suspense on our podcast. How dickish of me <laughs> would that be like if something legit bad happened, but I kept the show, just just continued the show. Air oh, my God. It's like the Great Wall of China. You're just oh building my. them into the wall, man. Yeah. <laughs> Joe would have wanted us to post this episode. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, he sacrificed everything he had to make sure he was in this episode. So please listen, um, like, and subscribe. Yeah, because if you don't, you're a bad person. Yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right. Uh, if your movie is going to give me both the inspirational speech and the name of your movie, I will capture it. So here you go. They mean to take us as a prize. <laughs> and we are worth more to them undamaged. Their greed will be their downfall. England is under threat of invasion. And though we be on the far side of the world, this ship is our home. This ship is England. So it's every hand to his rope or gun, quicks the word and sharps the action. After all, surprise is on our side. I love it. I love I love the the quick to the word and sharp is the action. I love that dialogue again going back to the the lyricalness of the speech and not going to lie. I've heard that speech 3 times and it was well, I guess now 4 for this one. <laughs> but it was the third time while pulling the clip before I realized <laughs> Surprise is on their side. The name of the boat is the surprise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Isn't it brilliant? Yeah. <laughs> like again, I, dadding 101 right there. Yeah, it's a dad joke, but I forgot that. Like I forgot that in the moment because again, the only time we there's two times we hear we see at the very beginning we get the opening surprise, 28 guns, 104 souls. And then yeah. later when the clip I played in the, in the intro when he mentions you know the surprise is not old, but he says it so quickly you miss I, it if I just blink, missed. Yeah. I just missed the word that was surprised. There's a lot of words that I missed had I not had closed captioning. Seriously, yeah. closed captioning yeah. saved me. On oh this movie. yeah. Mm-hmm. So for this sequence, though, for this this clip that you played, uh, something I actually did when I watched this was after I listened to it the first time, I went back. I actually closed my eyes and and listened to it a second time, and I almost thought I was listening to Chris Hemsworth Interesting. because. <laughs> Because that's that's oh. how similar they sound. Because I mean, they're obviously, you know, uh, even though Russell Crowe is New Zealand born, you know, he spent, a, you know, a good amount of time in Australia, and so because those guys are both from that area of the world, if you just listen to it, and I, I know I'm probably going to get some <laughs> some New Zealand hate. They're like, it's like, hey, it doesn't sound like that, you know. But like, but seriously though, like if you listen to it again, listen to it with your eyes closed and go, I'm getting some Thor one vibes here. I really am. They sound they sound very similar. That's um, that's interesting. I don't know what, what the what is this? Okay. Cole Gasper. What's going on? We just got attacked by the goonies from hell. There you go. There's a little Chris uh, Hemsworth for you. Yeah, that was definitely Hemsworth. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what's this one? You hit him with a truck. Yep. Yeah, I hit him with a truck. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> that was from the movie Extraction that we did uh, last oh, year. Oh, that's actually yeah, Ooh, I it's a solid that. one. I love that movie so much. I love it. I, yeah, I, I need to watch it again. It's so good. It's I love it so much. Um, okay, uh, that's all of the clips that I have, and so now I'm gonna take a, just a moment. I don't know why I said take a, just a moment uh, because apparently I'm 
uh, Italian. Hey, you're Mario. It's fine. I, well, we did just get a, a Switch, mm-hmm. so we've been playing a lot of Mario Kart. Ah, uh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to take a moment and say, uh, for those of you listening, next week there is no Cheap Seat Reviews episode. I'm on vacation, uh, first vacation in like two and a half, three years. We're going somewhere. There will be no show next week, no Cheap Seat Reviews show. But I have a treat for you. Next week... I will be in the normal time slot in the normal uh, the normal feed. We will be uh, releasing our first ever episode of Them's Fighting Nerds. Now, if you're listening to this show, you know wait a minute or not. You know if you're fans of Cheap Seat, I should say. Obviously, you're listening to this show because you can hear me. Um, I did have we did have a, a Them's Fighting Nerds podcast for about five episodes uh, with me and Sam, and it just fizzled out as a lot of podcasts do because um, didn't have enough time to do a second show. This is something different. This is a different show. This is a different take. Here's a little trailer I made. So next week, you will get the full episode of Them's Fighting Nerds. Hello, and welcome to Them's Fighting Nerds, a debate podcast where two nerds enter, one nerd leaves. Now, I'm just a simple Marvel fan. I don't know my Jack Kirby's from my Steven Ditko's. It's like he could be the strongest Avenger, but he's always got to be off doing something else. Like he's. I hope we're not being uh, graded on our accents because if we are, I'm in trouble. Who will it be? Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 or Thor Ragnarok as the greatest MCU movie? Find out August 4th. There you go. Nice try. So the, the premise of the show is quite simple. It's a debate podcast. The, the, how this thing all came to be is because I already had them spotting nerds as a, as a show and the artwork. Um, Cameron from the Green Shirt podcast, a newbie's trek through TNG, laid down this ridiculous claim. I shouldn't say ridiculous. He laid down an <laughs> audacious claim that Guardians of the Galaxy 2 is the a better is the greatest MCU movie, and that Thor Ragnarok was not only not the greatest MCU movie, but was in fact a bad movie. Oh, and um, that's bold. It is yeah. bold. And Jesse from Sudden but Inevitable took uh, took offense to that and uh, slapped him with a proverbial glove and said, "I challenge you to a duel." And so we created this show for them to have a debate. So it's a true debate show with five subjects. I award points as the both host and moderator of this episode. And, and the master I- debater. And master debater. And as uh, the idea is going forward, if there's going to be in our Potter and family, if more people want to throw down the gauntlet uh, challenge, uh, you know, this is the forum to do it. So this is our first episode. Uh, we hope to uh, do one a month because we all have our own regular shows and uh, two shows. It's just a lot. So we're going to do, hopefully we can try to do once a month. So next week, uh, during our normal release time, Them's Fighting Nerds Episode 1, who will win? Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 or Thor Ragnarok? You guys decide. I guess technically, it's which debate, debater wins. That, that's the movie. Anyway, go listen to it. It'll be great. Time for this. And now for some more bad news. Ready? Time for a little bit of trivia. I'm going to cook through this pretty good. Uh, This movie actually had a lot of trivia, like a lot of trivia. Um, But that's okay. Uh, We did mention that Russell Crowe learned how to play the violin for the film, and he said that it was the hardest thing he had ever done for a film. So, of course, that's up to 2003, so I don't know if something had become more difficult since then, but who knows. Uh, I mentioned that. Let's see. What else? Um, uh, this movie, I, we didn't mention this. This movie critically did really well. This movie was nominated for eight Oscars, by the way. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Now, the only won, thing that ha- Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say the only thing that kind of hamstrung it, uh, I think, in terms of visibility was the fact that, you know, the Return of the King yeah. dominated that award season. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Pirates came out at the same time. So there's. Uh, yeah, so yeah, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean was happening. Pirates of the Caribbean was that summer, and then this came out in fall. It was the November release, but then a month later was Return of the King. Yeah, and Return of the King, basically every award that Return of the King was nominated for, it won except the two that this movie won, which is kind yeah. of funny. Uh, and those being, it won Best Cinematography and Best Sound Editing, but it was. Yeah. Uh, but Let me it, talk about cinematography. I just want to pause real quick. Yeah, yeah. Did was it? Maybe you know this, and maybe it's in the trivia. I don't know. But 
this movie looked like a movie that was filmed in the 70s. There was a me. very film grain look to it. Yeah. yeah. And because uh, I, I think about a movie that I watched growing up called Shipwrecked, which was actually a Disney film. Yeah. I actually watched um, that like four weeks ago with the family. It doesn't hold yeah. up. It doesn't. No, it doesn't. <laughs> but, um, but I thought about that just the quality of like the quality of the film, the way that it looked on screen reminded me of that because I kept, as I watched it, I kept thinking, man, this is an old movie. But then I would see actors like Paul Bettany and Russell Crowe and Pippin. And I was like, okay, this is not old, but when they weren't on screen, can I, yeah. uh, Mark, you said you have this on DVD or Blu-ray. Did you watch it on that medium or on Amazon? No, I watched it on, on DVD. So I'm curious to know if what Andrew was talking about you experienced. Do you know? So I'm I'm assuming that there was uh, maybe some extra semen on Andrew's screen that might have caused <laughs> him to miss some of the cinematography. Uh, I'm smiling; you can't see my face, but no, I'm, I I do agree though. I mean, it's uh, it's a film that I think. It, obviously it was filmed on gimbals for a lot of it where the ships were mounted. Right. So, uh, they took a lot of effort to make sure that this was a very practical looking, authentic looking, uh, film. But, um, but even when you're doing some of the under deck shots, you know, I, I feel like I am looking through a filter where it just, you know, it just feels like there's a layer of grunge on the lens. Yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, I struggled with that a bit too. And I was watching it on a, you know, I guess, I mean, obviously you could get on DVD or on Blu-ray, but yeah, I got that same feeling. And so I, I totally agree. I, I, I don't reason, think it was a bad thing necessarily. To me, it was, it gave it a little nostalgia it, factor. The reason why I asked you specifically about your, your copy, because sometimes when it converts to digital, it doesn't convert well. And, yeah. and because this was on, I watched this on Amazon, which if you're listening to this episode, you have basically two days to go watch this movie before Amazon pulls it. Um, cause I got the <laughs> alert tonight that it's, it's getting pulled in four days. Um, but I, there was a couple of moments, mostly sky shots where the actors are in the foreground and you can kind of see sky. There was a very film grain look to the sky and there was uh-huh. a couple of, Oh gosh, that scared me. Sorry. <laughs> uh, no one can hear this except me, but I'm, uh, I'm, some music was playing. Sorry. Um, <laughs> for listening at home, it sounds like I'm having a, an aneurysm. I, it, I'm not. Just anyway. My point is, is that there was a weird kind of film, film to it. To answer your question, Andrew, I don't really know a, a reason why other than maybe that's just the way the transfer worked. Maybe that yeah, was. Maybe so. There was a couple of scenes. Well, not a couple. There was some filmed at the uh, water tank down in uh, Mexico where they filmed Titanic. So maybe yeah. that's green screen, you know, effect. I don't know. And it could be, it could be this, the model too, like the, mm-hmm. the model uh, filming. I, I think that might be where some of this comes in. Cause it, who knows what they carried over for congruency from filming the actual in-person stuff. And then the, uh, the, the scale models yeah. that were, that were yeah. also built. So I, I don't know. That's, that's, that's definitely a good question to ask. And, I mean, so when I was talking about the under deck thing, though, the under deck scenario and, and how that looked, um, the, like, you're right, Andrew, the, the grunge doesn't look bad. I mean, it, it, it almost kind of plays up even when uh, when Russell Crowe's talking about how, you know, she's a good boat and he's like, you know, tapping the windows and stuff. And, you know, it's like that grunge may have been done to even <laughs> invalidate his opinion because he's saying it's a great ship still and everyone else is kind of making fun of it. Yeah, right. So, mm-hmm. yeah. All right, guys, I actually just got upgraded to another tornado warning, so I'm going to disappear for another half hour. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, good luck. Um, I don't know if you'll be here when I get back, but I'll see you soon. <laughs> so while you're down in the basement, tweet, mm-hmm. uh, tweet message me your top three, and I'll read them on air yeah. if you don't get back. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Mm-hmm. Thanks, man. Good, yep. uh, be, good luck. Be safe. Will do. All those Thanks, things. guys. Jeez, mm-hmm. um, that just sucks. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. Uh, again, transitioning from from real life terrible to uh, back to this. During the film's pre production, the replica of James of Captain James Cook's ship, the HMS Endeavor, was circumventing circumnavigating the globe. The production was able to fly two cameramen to the ship as it was about to sail around the bottom of South America. 
a route that the surprise does take in the movie. Thus, the footage of the stormy seas that is part of the voyage is genuine. The oh. Endeavor <laughs> sails, sailors were used in costumes kept on board for display. So, real sailors in historical costumes on an actual ship going around the horn. That's just so cool to me. In that's a just, storm. In a real storm. That's just yeah. that, that's, that's so awesome. And that terrifying cool. at the same time. <laughs> After filming, the HMS Surprise was purchased by the San Diego Maritime Museum for an undisclosed sum with the proviso that the ship be loaned back to 20th Century Fox for any future film productions. Now, I captured this last piece of trivia because this is obviously... Um, anyone can edit IMDb. If you have a pro account, you can go into the trivia and edit anything. You know, I could go in there and get a pro account and say, Cheap Seat Reviews reviewed this movie. Yeah. So this is obviously the marketing person uh, for the San Diego Maritime Museum. This is what it says. Quote, if you would like to visit the magnificent ship and walk the plank, you can. It's located <laughs> at the Maritime Museum of San Diego, California. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> I, I love it. It's, yeah. all right. it's bad, but it's great. Yeah, it is. It's awesome. You're, both, you're right. Okay, time for this. Excuse me while I whip this out. Time for our top three. Top three movies. We decided to do ocean seafaring type movies. Uh, on I mean, that's Not necessarily period pieces, just movies on the high seas. Uh, Mark, I'll let you go first. Yeah, my first pick uh Technically, it does occur in the seas, but not on them, rather underneath them. Okay. Uh, it, in the abyss. Ah, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I just remember, you know, being being terrified as a kid because of that fear that a lot of us have about the ocean. You know, you don't know what's looking back sometimes. Right. Um, and the abyss just perfectly captured that for me. And honestly, still terrifies me quite a bit. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, otherwise, I... I kind of uh, went back above water and and actually on the beaches um, uh, for Castaway. I, castaway for me, it's like it's you know yeah it's on an island right, but it's still it's still most you know parts of it are very ocean related. We get There's Wilson out it, there yeah. and yeah, so uh, Castaway yeah uh, definitely was a just a good movie in general, but takes place on the ocean. Um, now I did have two movies though that are. Uh, you could you could say are equally uh well let's just say they're they're in the same school okay um so i went for deep blue sea because uh mm-hmm. you know who doesn't love a little a little <laughs> that little ditty about really intelligent sharks um <laughs> and uh my bonus movie out of this though cuz it was similar uh, or at least in the same vein was the meg uh which i thought was a fun it is fun you it's, know i would say that yeah. Yeah. Oh, fun yeah. You movie, should watch so. it. It's totally fun. Cool. Yeah. Jason Statham gets to punch a Megalodon. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, and I just I just love this whole like myth of the Megalodon, you know, because the Discovery Channel put that awful documentary. Uh, so now people think it's still out there, you know. Like, why the hell would you want a shark that large still hanging out? I just I don't know. But yeah, those are those are my three plus uh, plus one. Cool. All right. Uh, Joe hasn't hit me up yet, but he will just a moment. Not not worried about it. Um, I will do mine now. Uh, I did so. So the, I did two honorable mentions. I hope we don't take one, one of Andrews. So I too did a submarine movie with the Hunt for Red October. Oh yes. Um, mm-hmm. And uh. That's one of those movies, man. If it's on, I'm watching it. I can't tell you how many times where it's like 10:30 at night, trying to go to bed, turn the TV on, flip. <laughs> oh shit! It's Hunt for October. Oh, it's only 20 minutes in. Okay, I'll watch until the first commercial break. Uh, okay, I'll watch till the second commercial break. Okay, I'll watch it until Dallas flies out of the ocean. Okay, now we're good. I also did uh, the finest hours, which we did on the show. Oh. Um, yeah, I liked, yeah, yeah. I liked that. That was movie. a good one. I thought it was really good. A little rescue movie. Uh, mm-hmm. Disney produced it with uh, Captain Kirk. But my yeah. top three, uh, I think Andrew knew that I was going to say this one. Number three, Waterworld. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think you alluded that I was going to do that one. I like that movie. It's terrible. 
Uh, in fairness, I haven't watched it in a while. Um, and it was on some dumb channel. I think it might have been HBO about two months ago. And I, it was just the very end, like the very, like the last four, 10 minutes of the movie. And I realized just kind of how dumb that movie is. Um, not that I'd forgotten, I just re remembered. Uh, but yeah, Waterworld, I, just, I have a weird place in my heart for that movie. Uh, and I've also seen physically laid eyes on the floating steel island, the atoll that they go to in the Ooh. movie. Uh, it was uh, parked in Hawaii when we visited Hawaii uh, as a family that year. Number two, Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse uh-huh. of the Black Pearl. That um, The good one. It's really good. I, it, I think it still holds up. And that yeah. movie, um, I, I, that's the, nah, I just like the movie. And my number one, I just, this movie, just for some reason, just speaks to me. I've seen it two or three times. I really like it. It's probably not as fun as Pirates of the Caribbean. Actually, it's not nearly as fun as Pirates of the Caribbean, but I think it's a way better film. And that's In the Heart of the Sea. Yeah, oh, yeah. okay. I, just, I really like that movie a lot. Um, okay. Uh, we do have some Twitter people, but I'll let Andrew go. Let's see if Joe has te- uh, messaged me. Joe has. Joe says, number three, Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl. Number two, Deep Blue Sea. Yes. <laughs> and number one, The Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou. Oh, oh okay. yes. Yeah. So, cool. Sleeper yeah. pick. Yeah. Awesome pick. <laughs> what you got, Andrew? Well, I have um, I have a little animated film called Moana. Oh, Ooh. yeah. Such a good uh, film. Yeah. Uh, that's my number three. And number two, I have uh, Captain Phillips with Tom Hanks. I haven't seen that. Oh, yeah. I need to that's see a good one. It's a good one. And then number one, I have a film that I, I don't, you know, my, my son, he's going into third grade and he asked me the other day, do you, or what are you afraid of? Like, are you afraid of heights or, you know, do you have any fears? And there's one fear that I legitimately, it's like the worst fear I have. And that's of being underwater and running out of air and not being able to make it to the surface and drowning. Like that's that's the biggest one. So for me, my number one movie here because it freaks me out so much is called Sanctum, and it is about some cave divers that uh, are are diving in this cave and they are running out of oxygen. It's it bothers me. Did forty seven like meters bother you? Forty seven meters down bother you? It did a little, but not as bad as Sanctum. Okay, interesting. Yeah. And then I had the honorable mention of Finding Nemo and Finding Dory. Sure. <laughs> All those are good. I'm in an animated mood tonight, I guess. No, it's fine. No, my one is a great pick for that. Uh, Twitter verse, uh, we've got a, a couple here, just a couple. Um, and that uh, one is from our good friend Jesse from Sudden But Inevitable. It says, White Squall, Pirates of the Caribbean, mm. but Castaway is his, his best. And excuse me, and Maxton, good friend and listener, Maxton, who was on his own little review uh, show recently. I, I put a, a link out on Twitter. Uh, Maxton yeah. says, Deep Blue Sea. That's it. That's the only answer. <laughs> so, loving it. Loving it. I really am. Yeah. There you go. Thanks, Maxton. And Jesse, uh, that's it. Time for this. Wait, what's supposed to happen? This is where we give a movie, the movie, a score. I'll, uh, I'll message Joe. A score from zero to ten. Uh, ten being the best, and I think that's pretty obvious. Andrew, I'll let you go first. Well, um, yeah, like I said, I enjoyed it for the most part. It had a few moments that I was bored, but uh, and a few times that I didn't really care about people. So, <laughs> uh, But overall, I would watch it again. It's a pretty decent film. So IMDb puts it at a 7.4. Um, and because we had Paul Bettany uh, as Violet from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory for just a little while, as he was dying, um, he was very he was very purple and blue, uh, and that scene if you missed it. So I'm going to give it, uh, I'll say a six point two. Okay. Now I, I think I gave something recently a six point two. I'm going to give this a six point one. Okay. Uh, nothing that I see in the immediate re- 
Yes, your last 6.2 was Star Wars Episode 3. Yeah, oh, wow. I, like, I like this a little bit less than that. Okay. Just, yeah. A little <laughs> tiny sliver. Okay. <laughs> what you got, Mark? You know, I was actually going to stay in roughly the same area. Uh, I was actually going to say 6.5 initially because, uh, you know, I think this film passes in a lot of ways. Like the, I, I think the dialogue is good. The the action that we do get is good. And the relationship between Bettany and Crow is like, it's really, it's really well made. I think that part of it is obviously it's the focus because there's not a whole lot else they are focusing on. So um, yeah, I gave it the six and a half though, for some of the reasons that we talked about, the pacing is a little rough um, at times. I mean, if you're, cause I'll put it this way. If you're expecting action, then the exposition parts of this, or even the lack thereof at that point, might take you out of it. And if you're mm-hmm. just casually watching it at home, you might decide to turn something else on because, you know, it may not be your thing. Yeah. But I think for, for people that want that balance of, of drama, action, the historical setting and all of that, I mean, I think that could elevate this into a seven, you know, if you're that, that type of person. So are you, or what, what was your score eventually? So six and a half is where I'm at. Okay. okay. But I, I can definitely see where other people might get a little more value out of it than I did. Sure. Okay. I got you, Stan. I got you. Um, yeah. I, I think that's fair. Uh, yeah, if you're looking for... Yeah, this is not a popcorn movie. This is not a summer blockbuster. That's why it's released in November. I mean, it's not trying to compete with Pirates of the Caribbean. It's a different kind of movie. Uh, this is a you-need-to-pay-attention-to-it kind of movie, and that's okay. That is very okay. Uh, Joe has not responded. I asked him what he would give this. He hasn't responded, so um, we'll just go. Uh, I like this movie. I think it's really good. I think it's worth watching. I think um, if you like seafaring uh, movies, if you like... Um, one other thing that this movie, whenever you see like those dumb top ten lists of, of things that you see on BuzzFeed or whatever sites, you know, there's always like uh, ten most accurate, historically accurate movies. This movie is always ranked on that. This movie, though it's not historically accurate to a story to a point in history or to a to a specific story it's historically accurate in the depiction of life and i think that that's pretty cool that they did that They're, they didn't really cut any corners i mean i think it's neat so with that being said i'm going to give it a seven a straight up seven um out of ten uh well, hold on you said imdb gives us a what 7.4 7.4 you know what i'm gonna go with imdb i'm gonna follow the masses and say 7.4 because i think it's a good movie i think it is a really good movie and you know kind of looking around at other things that i've given a seven you know i gave a seven to, to hancock i think this is better movie than hancock would i rather watch hancock than this probably but this is a better <laughs> film and um yeah i'm okay with that it uh you know you have to almost ask the question of what would this movie look like if it had learned from the other things that we would see in the next like five or six years, right? Especially with um, some of the entertainment value that you see out of the Pirates of the Caribbean, right? Mm-hmm. And and some of these other blockbusters. That's what it makes me think of is is where could this have gone if it had just been, you know, not positioned precariously close to Lord of the Rings, Return of the King, and, and some of these other factors we talked about, but. But either way, though, it, it, it lives on in, yeah. in our hearts. And I think that Pirates is so similar as far as what you get from the films um, that maybe they decided, oh, let's abandon ship on this. Again, no pun intended. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think there are different enough vehicles and there are different enough things that... Uh, well, I, 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 I mean, of course, Pirates is a little more fantastical and this is more realistic. But yeah. 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 I I think it simply comes down to money. If if this maybe this movie wasn't marketed well enough or maybe it was just in, in a year where we already had one pirate sailing kind of movie and we were looking we were waiting and holding our dollars until Return of the King came out a month later. You know, maybe it just came out the wrong time. Maybe if it comes out the next year in 2004, 
Maybe it does mm-hmm. better. Who knows? But uh, I think it's a good movie, and you should go watch it. And that is all I'm going to say about that. Um, that's it. That's the show. I have really nothing else to say other than my quote game, where I will give you a quote. Uh, Mark, you don't have to participate. This is where I just, for the listeners, I have a giant movie poster my parents gave me. Uh, what movie, whose line is what it says, 101 classic movie quotes. Tonight, movie quote number 27. Andrew, this one's for you, buddy. Where we're going, we don't need roads. That, that made me tear up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Especially with my, my delivery of it, too, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, it was spot on. It's perfect. <laughs> it was spot on. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agreed that I would never try to actually uh, perform the line. I'm just going to read them. <laughs> um so there we go. That's that quote game. Valiant effort, though. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. This is an opportunity now for you to tell the fine listeners of both this show and, I guess, people who are listening to uh, because of your show, where they can find your show. I guess if they're listening because of you, they know how to find your show. But my listeners don't. Yeah, I mean, just in case you, you don't know where to find us, uh, we try to keep it pretty easy across social media. So we're at Digital Dissect One. Uh, the... The uh, thing that usually comes up everywhere, though, is if you type in uh, Digital Dissection, a nerd podcast, that's usually 100% guaranteed. Uh, But Digital Dissection typically works. But uh, yeah, outside of social media, we also do uh, run a blog. And the blog will cover some topics that our our main show can't always get to in time. So um, we've done some pretty fun side projects through that that uh, have been been great for us. So um, yeah. That's that's how you can find our little thing. Yeah. Do you go check them out, especially the episode I was on where we reviewed Serenity. Um, <laughs> and also, really kind of cool, fun little note here. The uh, gentleman that you had on for your music portion, Chris, and his wife, Leslie, um, the music you heard for the trailer for Them's Fighting Nerds, he wrote that. That's, oh, that's so that's, cool. That's his music. And then he wrote our theme, the intro to this show. He wrote mm-hmm. our theme. Um, I'll have to, well, I don't know that I can listen to your episode, uh, because I haven't watched all of Serenity. Oh, really? and uh, yeah, I watched it, uh, I think maybe five years ago and I stopped halfway through cause I didn't like it. Okay. Well <laughs> then don't listen to that episode cause it won't make sense. I'm waiting to the day that you make me do it for the podcast. So. Well, we will one day. We will eventually yeah. do it again for the podcast. And I say again, it was supposed to be our first episode, and it didn't happen. So, <laughs> Well, hey, Sean, before we go, I did want to wrap one thing uh, about our show recently. Yeah. Um, so we actually had on uh, Sean's, or Josh Sawyer, who is the uh, project director and lead designer for Obsidian Entertainment. And uh, it was a, just a awesome show we get to talk about uh some of the like genre defining rpgs that they made there the biggest game that i know some folks would know him for is fallout new vegas which is also a personal favorite of mine um and so we actually just dropped that this week so it's uh it's definitely a fun experience to really personify someone who gets asked a lot of gaming questions but not asked how is josh doing so we really spent some time uh, getting into that. But yeah, it was a really fun time, and that's out now. That's awesome. Go go find it. I will link to your um, your link tree and all that stuff in the show notes so that people can find your stuff. Cool. Um, that's it. Uh, the last thing I will say, the, the last thing I'm going to promote is, one, next week, Them's Fighting Nerds. I mean, if you're already subscribed to the show, you're going to get it anyway. But please... Please, please, please listen to that, and I want feedback. Guys, I'm begging you. Tweet at me. Message me. CheapSeatReviews at gmail.com. Email me. I don't care how you get me. I need to know feedback because we want this show to be successful, and if you guys love it, let me know. If you hate it, let me know because Cameron and uh, Jesse and I, we want this thing to be successful. We need your feedback. Please, please, please let us know. Also, Cheap Seat Reviews, for the first time ever, did an interview. We did an interview, and by we, I mean I. I did an interview with my friend Erica Hogan. That episode is also on the feed. Go listen to that. Uh, uh, she's a... Um, Mark, I, am so, I forgive me, I don't know. When did you start your, your podcast? So we officially kicked off uh, right around the end of March this year. Um, and... So you're it a, feels like you're a pandemic yeah, podcast. Yeah. 
Uh, actually, we, we we may have fallen within the pandemic, but the pandemic isn't why we okay. decided to do it. Okay. Um, jo, jo, yeah, Joe and I were basically formulating this idea for almost seven years, and we had a lot of content, and uh, and so yeah, that's why the show kind of just kind of kicked off. And then uh, I actually forgot to mention this: uh, we added a, a new co-host named Chelsea. She's been with us now for um, just about ten episodes or so. Um, so, I mean, yeah, we're, we're off to a quick start and we're loving it. Great. That's great. The reason why I ask is because I know a lot of people, um, especially a lot of other podcasters, even that we've had on our show, um, started their show because of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And Erica decided that instead of starting a podcast, she would become an actor. And within the time of the, of the pandemic, during the pandemic, she joined an agency uh, starred in a couple of national commercials, was on a uh, on a TV show that will uh, as a as a featured extra that will come out this fall, and she'll be in a feature film. Wow! So That's like awesome, yeah. Like, what did you do with your pandemic? Not trying to make anybody feel bad. I just think what she did is awesome. Oh, by the way, she also owns her own business. Go check out the interview; it's really cool. Okay, this is now by far probably one of the longest episodes we've ever done, and that is okay. <laughs> Because this was good content, and I really enjoyed having both uh, you, Mark, and Joe on the show. Joe is still in his basement, so we will wish him the best. And I will simply say at this point, com is our website. Go there. The links to all the things that you need to be successful with our show is there. Um, at Cheap Seat Cast is Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. We're on all those places. Please, we want to hear from you. Um, just about this show and any other show. We've got some more great guests lined up for you for August. So excited for August. Uh, we're going to have Jesse back on from the Sudden But Inevitable podcast, and um, we've got some more guests lined up for uh, for August. I can't, I'm not going to mention just yet, but it's very cool. 2021 20, is the year of the guest. Uh, people seem to like it, and I like it, and that's what matters. So, and Sam will be back when I, we get back. We'll have Sam back uh, back in August. So on behalf of uh, Joe, Mark, Andrew, and Sam, this is Sean saying thank you so much for listening, and we will see you in two weeks. This is Cheap Seat Reviews.